be recorded and we need to let you know that and and by participating in this meeting you are giving your consent to be part of this and having it be um, recorded so looks like it's already recording all right so Ashley asked me to record okay so Ashley can we go to the next slide please And Ashley is here with me. Ashley is the Agriculture and Natural Resources Educator for Garrett County, and I am in Allegheny County. Ashley, do you want to say hello? Or are things too crazy over there? Hey, how is everybody tonight? Great. Thanks for having us, and I'm glad everyone could join us. Uh, we have a small group, so maybe we'll get a few more as these storms kind of, uh, you know, lay down a little bit. We'll get a few more people that decide to hop on, but I'm excited to hear what Jules has to say, and I think it's going to be a real fun class. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Ashley. So, um, we, uh, Ashley and I represent the University of Maryland, the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, and as I said, we are uh, natural resource educators, and we also um, are master gardener coordinators in our respective counties. I'm in Allegheny, she's in Garrett, so we manage a group of uh, Master Gardener volunteers. Uh, Jules' presentation today is, um, is his own, and he's a guest speaker for us, so we're just really excited to have him. He's a private consulting forester, and he has 35 years of experience as a licensed forester in Maryland, and he's also a member of the Allegheny County Forestry Board. And uh, if, if you're not familiar with forestry boards, uh, in Maryland, I believe it, almost every county has a forestry board, but um, they can be very helpful resources for property owners and uh, they're concerned with promoting conservation and sustainable forestry practices in their county and in the rest of the state. And they can be a great source of information and educational uh, programs and, and other things. So I think with that, I am going to hand it over to Jules and let him uh, take it away. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, so if we can go to the first slide, um, which should say planning for success. And we'll look forward to that. Um, <clears throat> so I've been spending all day working on forest stewardship plans for a couple of my clients. So this is all very fresh uh, kind of on my mind right now. But I'm looking forward to basically sharing what a consultant does uh, and how uh, a private consulting forester can be helpful uh, for landowners. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit about, um, I guess, the, the couple of primary things that we do. <clears throat> so I see the, uh, the slide that's on there. I do not see the um, title. There you go. Great. All right, next slide. And what we're looking here, uh, the picture there is of um, a landowner's property that I worked with in uh, Bedford County, Pennsylvania, actually. Most of my work is done in Allegheny County. But uh, this one, we had a, uh, a semi-retired couple that had about 10 to 15 acres of land, and they wanted to improve it um, for uh, their use for hiking and aesthetics and all that. And that um, slide right there is the same uh, same area as the first slide, you can see that we've done a lot in terms of removing grapevines and getting rid of some crooked trees and some dead trees, and now it's a, a much more usable um, property for those folks. Next slide, please. Ready for the next one anytime. Thank you. So um, we've got a couple of photos here with the, the, um, as far as a starting point, and I, um, I guess I'd be curious to know of the, of the folks that are here, how many people, um, are you landowners, um, and roughly what size property do you have? Um, so maybe people could respond um, if they're interested in the chat box, um, and I may or may not be able to see that. Um, but I'm sure that Sherry or Ashley can let me know what's going on with that. Um, and I'd also like to know, I, I guess, um, 
if people have a forestry plan of some kind uh, for their property. So while you're doing that, uh, if you take a look at those two pictures there side by side, uh, there's quite a bit of difference. Uh, the one on the left is um, a property that was purchased by somebody that, and the property had been heavily uh, cut over. It had been logged and it had not been logged very well. And that one um, uh, really needed a lot of work and a lot of care to get it back uh, into production. And as opposed to the slide on the right, uh, you're looking at a photo of a fairly well-managed forest and some people are fortunate enough to start with something like that, and that actually gives you a lot more potential um, for the future. Uh, next slide. Hey, Jules, while we're waiting for the yep. next slide, so yeah. um, one, of, one of our folks responded and says that she currently lives in Orlando, but she has 28 wooded acres in Pittsboro, North Carolina, and their plans for the property are to clear at least 10 acres for pasture, but they want a buffer around the property. And it is divided by a private road with six acres on one side, and that's where the house will be, and there's a nice creek there. And then on the far side where the pasture will be is a seasonal stream. She says, we found several stands of wild blackberries and tons of blueberries as well. She wants to keep the small, smaller parcel more rustic, and they want a walking trail around the entire property. All right, that sounds like a great plan. <clears throat> that sounds very workable also. Uh, one of the things that consultants do, it's kind of like our job to um, listen to you and what you're looking to do, kind of what your goals are, um, and then we evaluate the resource that you have and try to you know, match the, uh, the potential of that resource with your goals and come up with an idea that would help you reach those goals uh, as soon as possible. But those, that sounds very workable. Um, okay, our, um, our next picture here, um, and I'm gonna try to also catch up with mine on my photo, but the, uh, the next picture here is of an area taken many years ago. This is in Allegheny County, Maryland. And the purpose of having this old photograph in front of you, you can see the red outlined um, parcel of property that looks like uh, this it says the word woods on it. Um, and what you see around it is a lot of agricultural land, uh, fields and other forest, and so there's really not much going on there. Uh, next slide. And so I want to compare what you see with the older photo with a, a slide that shows a little bit more of what it looks like today because the challenges for managing that particular piece of property have changed. So this is more like it looks now, and you can see um, where the, uh, the dark, the black line is the same parcel of property, and the red dotted line is now the only access or the only good access into that, into that parcel. And it goes through um, a rather high-end subdivision and also the neighbors include other houses that have moved in um, and a, an elementary school. And so the challenge for that particular piece of property with those landowners, they wanted to do a, a partial harvest and that required having logging trucks go right through the, uh, the residential area. And so that you know, had the potential to raise a lot of questions It had the potential to um, raise some resistance to what they wanted to do. And so you just have to be aware of what you're up against. In that particular case, we met with uh, several of the landowners in that subdivision and talked about what we were going to do and why we were going to do it, um, and everything ultimately turned out uh, just fine. Uh, communication is often the key with your neighbors when you're doing something. Uh, next slide. Hey, Jules. Yes. We got uh, a response from another participant, and he says that he has 52 acres in Cecil County. Uh, they want hardwood trees, trails, and native trees and plants for wildlife. Okay, yeah. There, whenever, when you get to a parcel of that size, there are a lot of possibilities. Um, and that also sounds like a doable, a doable kind of thing there. Um, 
Yeah, and again, it sounds like the folks that are on right now do have some uh, particular goals in mind, and that's really good. I, and I, as I'll talk a little bit later, I have had some folks that did not have any particular goals in mind when they started, and we'll go over that too. Um, but I guess you just have to know what to expect, um, and that's where the consultant can, can help you say, is this going to work or not. The slide that you see right now is one of my favorite photographs. And that is only in here to point out the fact that uh, there's a lot going on on the forest floor that we may or may not always see. And so whatever we do uh, with the rest of the property can potentially impact uh, the habitat you know, for the salamander or anything else. And so you do need to know which, um, which kind of goals you have, what's important to you, um, because um, reaching those goals can involve changing the property um, to a small extent or to a large extent, and it can have effects on what happens on the ground. And there may be some either temporary or long-term disturbance. Um, it also points out that uh, with many plans, we will uh, work with the landowners to identify what are called special sites. And that can be a wide range of things, but it's something that's special to you that maybe you want to avoid um, disturbing, and so that should be noted if you're working with a consultant as well. Tell them you know, if you, that you don't want a particular area uh, bothered by any whatever the activity might be. Um, next slide, please. Does anybody know what kind of salamander that is, by the way? I'll let people type in if they, if they know that one. <clears throat> I do. It's um, one of my favorite, but I'll wait. I do. I'll wait to see if anybody else knows, though. <laughs> All right. Great. So this next slide here the, it talks about uh, this is the intro to the forest management plan. Um, this is one of the primary things that a consultant um, or even a state-employed uh, forester should be able to give you um, to help you manage your property. And so this uh, a management plan takes uh, – all the characteristics of your property into consideration and blends that with your goals and then comes up with a, an approach with some actual measurable objectives to help you know what is the next step to help you um, accomplish your plan. So next slide, please. Hey, Jules, we don't have any guesses, so are you going to tell us? That's a red EFT, E-F-T, <laughs> which is the land form of the newt. I think they're cool. They are cool. Yeah, you wouldn't think they're the same creature, but uh, they are. So this um, is a picture of a plan that I did. Kind of gives you some idea that inside that plan you will have a map uh, of the property, and you will have uh, several pages of um, descriptions of what's going on in that particular unit. And we like to take a lot of photographs when we do plans um, so that people know what we're talking about, we'll often refer to the photographs in the text, um, makes it a little bit easier to understand. Um, so I'm not going to read all the, of the text there, but you can see what a typical plan um, would include. And it can, be, um, it's, it can be pretty comprehensive, and there are a lot of uh, great resources on the internet that we tap into as well when we're writing plans, um, including the the county soil surveys, um, wildlife that's in the region. Um, most counties and states have some sort of database now of uh, sensitive species that they're concerned about, which would be like rare, threatened, and endangered things. Um, they will have maps of uh, areas such as riparian, that's a waterway, you know, a creekside area that they might want to be protecting. And so a lot of things can be incorporated into your plan uh, to help you better understand your property. Uh, next, please. I can see it's going to be easy to burn an hour, isn't it, Sherry, with me talking? Because I can talk. Yes, forever. yes. All right, so here we go. It says, uh, how do I proceed? And so you need to find out what you want from your property. And that may vary if it's a property that you're living on or whether it's a property that you only visit from time to time. But what are your interests, hopes, and goals? And as we've already heard tonight, some folks have that, um, have a great start on that. And then you need to investigate the property's potential, and that's where uh, 
the consultant can come in. Um, we would provide a, an evaluation of the property. But critical to making something happen is the next little section there called analyzing your resources. And you need to, to think about how much time do you have um, to put into this, uh, to making your property what you want it to be. What kind of skills do you have? Uh, is there available money um, or other resources that you can put toward it? And what uh, contacts do you have with people that might be helpful in terms of um, either paid labor or volunteers? And so then we merge all of that together uh, and get to work. Uh, so next slide. Uh, this slide is here to warn you if you don't like snakes, um, you might want to close your eyes and your ears for a minute or two because the next slide has a photo. So go ahead and go to that one. Um, anybody know what that snake is? Should be pretty well known. East, East Coast. Um, I'll let you guys guess or tell me what it is. Um, but these are the pitfalls to avoid when you're working uh, with your forested property. And I think the first one I, I put, because I'm pushing the idea of a plan, is not having a plan. Um, second thing is not knowing your boundaries. Uh, it's really important to know where your property lines are and try not to um, take that uh, for granted. Yes, it is a timber rattler. That's right. Um, Having a timber sale without a contract or having a timber sale without a forester involved, uh, you might regret that um, because you're leaving a lot of things to chance. And, and I'll just I'll make a comment here about loggers. Um, if, if, by the way, do we have any loggers on here? Um, that would be interesting to know. Um, loggers are often, those are the folks that will come into a, a forested property and cut the trees down if it's necessary and if you need um, some income or if you're trying to accomplish a certain goal like making things better for wildlife. Um, typically you would need a logger to do a commercial sale. And the thing to point out is that we can't do, there are a lot of things we cannot do without loggers, but you need to have um, a good logger on your property, somebody that is technically good in the forest, who's careful around your trees, uh, as well as having someone who is ethical, who will um, abide by the contract that you have, and who will pay you um, what you're owed. Um, yeah, so there's a, a comment. Had four logging companies and one of the timber, but I like the big trees. Yeah. Uh, and often I, I will say that, you know, the loggers are in the business for making money. Without them, we wouldn't get a lot of things done. Um, but loggers, by and large, the majority of them are not foresters. Their, their job is not to know what is the best for the long-term sustainability of the forest. Their job is getting a product to market, and we need them, um, but you also need the advice uh, of a forester or a land manager so that you come out with something that you're happy with. Uh, the last pitfall is ignoring any tax considerations. Um, and I, that's a whole topic by itself, but a, a brief one is if you sell timber and you, uh, and you don't use a particular form called Form T, for stand, like stands for timber, um, to report your sale proceeds to the government, then you will be taxed at the regular capital gains rate. And so what you want to do is use the Form T, and that will give your, you know, you'll wind up paying less tax. That's just a very brief there's a lot more to it than that, but that's a, a tip right there. And finally, in, in Maryland, if you have five acres or more of forest land, you can register that property with the tax office after you have a plan, and you can get a tax um, deduction for having that property um, uh, listed. So um, next slide, please. like the snake is moving and getting bigger. It's pretty scary. Just keep going. Okay, there's the minimum, the minimum management plan size. In Maryland, um, the other thing to know is that if you want to have a plan and you do not have one yet, uh, and you have five acres or more of timber, the Maryland uh, government will help pay for someone to write your plan. 
and you have options. You can either pay the, the uh, Maryland foresters. Uh, they have a set rate for what they charge for the plan, or you can pay a consultant to draw up the plan. Typically, the consultants are, are I'm going to say, almost always um, more expensive than what you would pay for from the uh, Maryland State DNR. However, Maryland will help pay for that, and so the, the difference um, is often not very much. And then you do get a, a, a uh, property tax break, and if you, again, if you need to have five acres or more, and you can get, um, get your taxes reduced. And let me, I will say something there, just a quick story. Um, if you follow through with any of this and you uh, have a plan written and you intend to get that tax break, you do need to notify the taxing authority that you have a plan and need to provide them with a copy of your plan. I know one person who uh, had a plan written, but for whatever reason did not report it for 10 years, and he could have saved himself $30,000 over 10 years if he had reported that. So uh, I wouldn't want to lose $30,000. Uh, all right. You read my mind. Case studies. I'm going to try to run through um, three studies. And the purpose of doing this tonight is it will help some of you that already have some ideas. It will let you know what other people have done, and it might give you some new ideas for your plans uh, for your property as well. So I'm looking at three things. The first one is a, um, uh, a couple that had ample resources financially, uh, a small amount of land, and they started out with no goals. The second one, the folks had some resources and some land and some very specific goals. And finally, we'll look at one that had um, very few resources financially, but a lot of land and a wide range of goals. So next slide, please. And what we're looking at here um, is another, it's a, a property um, in a residential area. The outlined area in blue is essentially their backyard, um, and it was about a half an acre. And when they first came uh, to me, uh, they really did not uh, have any goals for this property. But you will notice um, with that property, it's adjoining other forested properties. And it also, at the uh, south, south side of it, the lower side, it is uh, not clear in the photo, but it's adjoining a stream as well at the lower end. And so they did have some opportunities because of that. So next slide. Uh, when they started out, uh, this couple really had no goals in mind at first. And so we talked about uh, what they would like to do. And the... What they came up with was the first thing was, was aesthetics. And I said green and gold because they wanted to see green leaves, green trees um, from their home um, through most of the year. And the gold they're talking about there is not money, but it was the fall colors. And so we were trying to identify trees that would actually turn yellow or gold because that was their favorite fall color. Next, they wanted to make sure it was a healthy forest and then they wanted to have some recreation back there, and they wanted to get firewood. So next slide, please. And for them, the recreation and firewood kind of, kind of went together, actually, as you'll see in a second. So as I mentioned, they were contiguous with other forest land. They have a stream. And they, when we went out to look at the property, we figured out that the area by the stream was very different than the area closer to their home. By the stream, they had 75-year-old hardwoods with a hemlock understory, very pretty along the stream. And then they had an old field um, that had probably 30-year-old, uh, and I call them pole size. That's a, a technical term that really means about 4 to 10 inches in diameter. And the, most of those trees were in pretty bad condition. And they had lots of non-native plants. Now, Sherry, I think you're going to either have done or going to do a series on non-native invasives, is that right? Yes, Ashley did uh, a class on that about a week ago, and it has okay. been recorded on our YouTube channel. Okay, that's great. So next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> this was just a quick photo of uh, what their property looked like near the stream looking up into the, into the trees and into the canopy. So next slide. 
the surprising thing that we learned um, was even though they just had a half an acre, they had all of these species of trees. Um, there are trees and shrubs and all of these, uh, I believe all of those are native. I'm looking at it quickly to remember. Yes, they are. Um, and there were a lot of, uh, a lot of them had flowering uh, plants as well. So, um, next slide. This was the area of the, what we were calling the old field area, which had the pole-sized trees and a lot of, in, of the invasive plants. Next slide. So these were some of the plants that they, that they had. Um, you may recognize some of the names. Um, uh, Daylily is one that you might not think of so much as an invasive, but it can take over. It's kind of its advantage and disadvantage. It's very pretty, and it can spread if you like that, um, but it also can crowd out other things. And they also we found when we were working out there, we found that there was a, uh, a fairly significant dump on their property um, that they unfortunately acquired with uh, the property. So we did some cleanup there as well. So next. After taking a look at their half-acre property, and after we had talked with what they wanted to do, we came up with this list of recommendations. That was to get some control on those invasives, start getting rid of those, um, cutting the diseased and dying trees to provide the firewood that they wanted, um, pruning the broken branches to help their aesthetics as well as the tree health. We added a brush pile um, for wildlife cover, because um, ev just about everybody likes to see animals. Um, we planted a few native shrubs and trees to replace the invasives that we took out and then created a campfire area and trail to the stream. So next. Uh, this photo is of that same um, old field area, which it looks a little bit more like a yard now, but has um, we've we removed a lot of the disease trees and we've planted some trees and shrubs there. Uh, and so it made it a much more aesthetic um, site for them. Next. Uh, for that particular job, believe it or not, on just a half acre, we cut 31 trees. And that yielded several uh, cords of firewood. And they used those firewood, uh, that firewood primarily for an outdoor campfire area. Next. Jules. Yes. We have, we have a question um, about sure. the, the brush pile. Uh, I guess they're asking uh, the purpose of the brush pile and when you would do that as opposed to just having shrubs. Right, yeah, the purpose is to actually provide um, significant cover. And you can see from the photo right now, it's a, it's a pretty good sized pile. Um, and so it provides a place and you, you the short story is you build the brush pile for the kind of animal that you're trying to protect, essentially. So if you do not want a bear on your property living there, you do not create a large interior space in a brush pile. You keep the opening very low to the ground. We often build them like in a log cabin fashion first um, with crisscrossed logs up to a certain height, depending on what animal you want to encourage to live there. And then we pile um, branches on top. And one of the, aside from the advantage for the animals, uh, the other advantage is you can use the branches and some of the trees that you're cutting if, they, if you have things that need to be cut. Um, you can use it right there on the property without having to burn it or without having to chip it or haul it away, and it becomes a useful, um, useful addition to the property. And the only thing you, I guess one concern is you need to know, you know, what can you tolerate aesthetically uh, you might not want to have a pile of brush near your house. You might want it further back in the woods. Um, and also you just decide to, um, to make it for whatever animals you have. I'm reading the note. Yeah, I'm going to say part of that. Um, so we found that it's, it also, you know, it's a way ultimately it biodegrades, provides a little fertilizer uh, for the property as well. But a brush pile like this that you see uh, in front of you could work for um, a rabbit, um, 
a groundhog, a turtle, salamanders. Um, there's a whole whole variety of things that could go in there. Birds will use them as temporary shelter throughout the day as well, too, when they're looking for insects or just finding a place to perch. Uh, and, of course, if you made it bigger, you could get you know a whole host of raccoons or bears or something else, foxes, coyotes. So you have to know what, you're, what you want and what you don't want. Okay, next one. Yeah, I'm going to keep moving here pretty quickly. This is a – go ahead and, and uh, scroll through those. You should see some uh, – with your next slides, you should see some different invasive species photos popping up. Um, we will show – let's see, I think it's a bush honeysuckle. It's probably on the upper left. Uh, to the right would be mile-a-minute vine. That's a nasty one. Um, the bottom right – should be autumn olive, and the other one um, is looking like barberry. I'm pretty sure it might even have some wine berry in there, but I think that one was a big barberry shrub. Okay, next. I noticed the comment about a creek that runs to a reservoir. That's where you really have to be careful with protecting that water quality, and so nothing better to do that than trees. All right, next next slide. I don't know how many. That was a, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, Streamside seating and trail markers. So we converted the, the back end of the property closer to the stream uh, as kind of a destination. So they had uh, some seating and a campfire area. And just for fun, because they had kids and grandkids, they did things like the trail markers. You didn't really need a trail marker for a half acre area, but um, but it was fun and it looked looked pleasing when they were done. Next, we're going to look at the uh, the summary. For this one, we're done talking about the first one. Basically, I just wanted to summarize with the next slide, and it has um, what we did listed and the cost, so you can get an idea of what this this kind of stuff will set you back for. Well, we cut 31 trees, uh, did one brush pile, pruned 18 trees, planted 40 trees and shrubs, built a hiking trail, removed a load of metal and a load of debris from the dump, and we began control of the invasive plants. Um, that was over a three-year period, um, and, it, and it cost $2,000. And that was an out-of-pocket cost. Um, again, these folks um, had the resources for that. And there was no cost sharing involved on this because a half acre is not big enough to put into an official plan. And so um, they were not eligible for cost sharing from the government for any of that. Whereas if you had a larger property, some of those things would be able to be cost shared. So, okay, next. The next slide is a picture of who showed up once we finished everything. So if you build it, they will come. Uh, that fellow right there did take advantage of the brush pile. Next. <clears throat> On the next slide, I'm just giving a shout out to some Allegheny College forestry technicians that helped with that project over a couple of years. Uh, Chris Barb and Stephen Lowe, some of you, if you're local, you might recognize those names. Um, uh, you can start going for the next slide, and I'll just say that if you know someone who wants a, uh, a career in forestry, uh, they should consider Allegheny College for the forestry technician program as a starting point. Yeah, so um, with these next slides here, what are your goals? Yeah, you can, you can scroll down through there. It might be firewood. And that shows a lot of firewood um, as a result of a thinning that we'll talk about. Yeah, just keep scrolling on. Just go ahead next for the next four of them. Uh, aesthetics, you might have flowers on your property that you want to enhance or highlight. You might want a hiking trail. Um, and then there's a really large brush pile uh, for wildlife that would service everything from a turtle to a bear. And uh, that particular bear chased me through the woods for over a mile one day. That was an interesting experience. Next, that's a story for another time. 
the uh, the final slide there on what your goals might be. They might include um, timber sales. Um, and yes, the bear really chased me for a mile, but he wasn't after me, or he would have killed me. I think. So he was just curious. So this photo um, is of a uh, a what we call a log landing. Uh, which is the place where the loggers would drag the trees that they've cut from the forest down to a, a spot where they can be loaded on the truck. And this shows several different products um, all in one in one photo. If you can go back to the that uh, photo with the, the log landing, um, this particular company is sadly no longer in business be, for a variety of reasons, but not because they were bad perhaps even more because they were so good at what they did, they probably spent too much time taking care of things. <laughs> but um, the truck there is loaded with pulp wood, which is the term we use for trees that go to the paper mill. Uh, the ones that are stacked um, perpendicular, like the log with a hole in the base of it, those are going to be used um, for railroad ties in this particular job. Um, Oh, the one with the hole may wind up, that may have wound up actually going for pulpwood once they found out how far the hole went. And the ones in front, the longer logs, those are going, uh, in this job, they went for saw timber to be sawn into boards. So, um, next. Okay. Um, the next case study is coming up, and that's um, was a really interesting one. Well, for me it is, anyway. Um, this was a... a uh, a couple that had about, again, about 10 to 15 acres of property. And their goals were, they had their goals in mind when they called. They wanted income, which is the other green and gold, I call it. Um, they wanted recreation, uh, variety. He was a hunter, and so he wanted to improve the habitat for deer specifically, for white-tailed deer hunting. They also liked to do hiking on the property, and they wanted an ATV trail. They wanted to put in a future house site, uh, and they needed firewood. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, when we went out there, we found out these were the things that we learned um, about that particular property. They had, again, two distinct forest stands. And, and as you, you're kind of getting the terminology as we go along, if, if the uh, particular area has definite characteristics that are like um, that are alike, we would call it a stand. So if you have certain age and size and species, trees it might be one stand, whereas much younger or much older um, trees in a different area or widely different species might compose a different stand. And then you would treat those uh, stands with differing um, objectives and differing procedures to get what you want. So with this particular property, we had an 80-year-old oak stand with lots of black gum and very little oak regeneration. Regeneration is the word for baby trees. We wanted to get some uh, younger oaks coming back to replace the older ones eventually. They also had a very uh, steep area uh, with slightly younger trees uh, with mostly pitch pine and oak. You can go to the next slide. And so we had to find out, once we knew what they had, um, given that they wanted income, we knew that we would going to need to do a timber harvest. And so uh, the next slide is going to show the property um, as it looked before uh, when we started. Um, and you'll see when that slide pops up that it was fairly crowded. Um, I see the comment there that you've cut down a lot of sweet gum to give the smaller oaks more space. That's great. That's a good idea. Um, yeah, black gum and sweet gum are, um, they're often, they're the same species, two different names. Um, and there are, there is also a sweet gum in a different part of the country that is a different species from our black gum. Um, but a lot of people in Allegheny County call black gum sweet gum here. Um, but they both compete with oak. So as you're looking at that photo, the green branches that you can see that would be at about head height um, that's almost all of that was black gum, and it was providing too much um, shade to allow any oak seedlings to get established. 
And so we're always thinking um, for the future. Foresters, one of our jobs is to think about 100 years down the road. And so uh, we're not always looking at things just as they are, but we have to imagine what's going to happen in the future. And uh, everything changes. I guess that's a, a good place to throw in the fact that some people think that the forest will always stay the same, but it doesn't. It will always it'll always change, um, and all trees, sadly enough, eventually die. And so we have to be thinking about what's going to happen when these trees get bigger, and and if they're going to get diseased, or if they're going to be crowded out, or whatever. So, as a, just as a looking at that uh, photo as an example. What I see as a forester is that we should probably get rid of some of that black gum understory um, to allow more light to the forest floor, and we should be thinning out the oaks um, so that they can, the individual oaks that are left can have more room to grow, more light, and get more moisture. And the whole purpose of all this is we're kind of thinking of what that person wanted in, you know, at the beginning. They wanted to make some money. They wanted to... Um, have a better wildlife area for recreation and if the oaks are thinned out then the individual oaks that are left are going to be ultimately producing more um, acorns for the deer and for the turkey and the squirrel so those were some of the things that we were looking at you can go to the next slide and I'm also thinking of the recreation the black gum uh, was pretty hard to walk through in some places it was really thick and you couldn't see through it uh, either to hike or to hunt um, okay, so this is the rest of the property, very steep, very rocky, obviously. Uh, the trees were generally smaller in diameter because the soil wasn't as, um, it wasn't as deep. And so for a lot of reasons, um, including the fact that it would be very difficult to get equipment in there, plus it would be very damaging to an easily erodible soil, we decided to leave that back section that was steep alone. So next slide, please. Um, the next slide just talks about our recommendations. We, we told the landowners that the best thing to do would, in this case, would be a crop tree release along with understory removal. And so what that means is a crop tree is what you're picking out. Those are the trees that you choose to be the ultimate crop for you. So we wanted to keep oaks and hickories for their wildlife benefit and for the hunting and also for increased future value if they wanted to do another sale down the road. Um, so we released, we picked the trees that were uh, competing with those good crop trees, and we, when we chose those to be cut at the first harvest. And we also said no cut on, this, on the slope. So next slide, please. Now with the next slide, you will see we encountered some problems. Be um, because it was a small acreage, there were initially no loggers interested. There was just not enough value. Also because we were removing mostly pulpwood um, back in the day when the, um, when the paper mill was still open, um, pulpwood is not a high value product. And the black gum understory, um, it was, what I mean by highly visible area is we were right next to a road. And so if we were to simply cut those black gums down and leave them on the ground, it would have been a mess. And I don't think the neighbors would have appreciated it. And finally, um, the deed covenant um, for the property said you cannot do a, a clear cut, which is removing all the trees at the same time. Now, that wouldn't have been um, something we would have done in this particular case. However, we did need to keep that in mind that we would never be clear cutting. Um, so... You can go to the next slide. Also, you see there I mentioned that the black gum understory, if we simply cut it, because we're talking really small black gums, like an inch, two inches, three inches. If we had cut them and just left them on the ground, it would have been hard to hike and, and use an ATV as well. So how do we solve all those problems? Well, we had, there was an adjoining neighbor um, who also had a forestry plan and had similar timber, and we wanted to find out if he was interested in selling his timber at the same time, and he was. And so we were able to join two landowners together, um, and that was uh, a better deal for a logger. And secondly, we uh, discussed, you know, getting rid of all that blackum and how, that, how we could do that. And what we came up with was we found a logger who had access to a large, a very large commercial chipper, 
and they brought that to the property. And so they were able to cut and chip all of the black gum um, on site, which made it much easier to handle, um, and then take that on to the pulp mill already chipped. Next slide. So part of what we're showing there is you just have to be creative um, in your thinking about how to accomplish what you want, and then don't you know don't get set back by the initial evaluation. So there's a picture of the of the job as it went, and the other thing that we did for this for this folks um, these folks is that we chose the um, the location for the log landing was the area where they wanted to put a garage. And so we not only got the timber harvest done, we were able to clear the site for the garage at no cost to the landowner. Um, and so we wound up with, uh, that was just a kind of a, a bonus right there. And then the, the um, trail that we built into the property became his driveway. Next slide. And in this next picture, what you're going to see is what it looks like, um, what it looked like after it was thinned out. And granted, this is in um, the early, either the early, I think this is the early spring, and so you wouldn't see as much um, of the uh, the previous. That already went to the next slide, um, but that's a good a good comparison. So that was the original slide of what it looked like before, and then the one previous. That's um, what it looked like afterwards. So you can see we got rid of all the black gum. So um, keep going. Next slide. We're going to show you some other creative things. Um, so back to what are your goals? How will you achieve them? Um, thinking about when you when you get your plan, one of the things that will be in your plan is a, a section toward the end that would be the recommendations. And that is the steps that you would be taking to achieve those goals and help you get your property looking the way you want it. And so you have to consider then, how are we going to do that? Um, are you physically able to do all the work? Um, perhaps on a small area you are. Um, but if you have 50 acres or 100 acres or 500 acres, you probably um, in this lifetime won't be able to do uh, everything that would be needed to make it the way you want. So you may need to look at contract labor or volunteer labor. And under the category of volunteer, if you know, if you have some friends who are hunters and, you, and if you are willing to have them hunt on your property, um, or if you want to lease your land to a hunting club and become a slightly more formalized agreement, you will often find that the folks who are hunting a particular area of land are more than happy and willing to do things like trash removal, um, boundary line marking, just kind of generally keeping an eye on things. And also you may find some environmental groups that are willing to come uh, do cleanups or uh, tree planting or things like that. Uh, next slide. Uh, those photos are of, of people younger and stronger than I am that we were able to uh, tap into them uh, for some volunteer labor on a different property. So this is the final study. Um, we have a large property with fewer resources, and hopefully this will give you some ideas um, for your property, especially if you have like 50 acres or more. Um, and then we get to talk about some resources, um, such as the cost-sharing programs. So next slide. The, the one property where many of the photos are, are coming from, but not all, um, was a nonprofit uh, corporation that had very little resources. And so they relied heavily in the initial years on volunteer labor uh, and also um, some cost sharing from the government. So you can go to the next slide. Maybe it's just acting up. Jules? Have, uh, yes. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Got it. Great. Okay. Um, so a lot of things are going on in this in these three pictures. Um, timber stand improvement is something that is often recommended in a, in a plan, and it basically is what you do 
before you have a commercial sale. And so you you typically either do this work yourself or you might hire someone. It, usually what it what that means is you're looking at an out of pocket expense of some kind or another, but the point is to make your property better for the future. You will typically see some benefits in the short term as well as um, better growth on your trees for the long term. So the upper left uh, picture with a young man in the, in, the, in the snow and a pair of lopping shears, he's cutting grapevines. Um, and if anybody knows who that is, you can, you can type that in. He won't mind the attention. Um, it's not me. Um, and I might even tell you who it is, but you'd have to be local to know probably. Um, he's a fellow that worked with me for many years, uh, great guy. Um, he's cutting grapevines from trees because uh, grapevines, they're, they're good and bad. The good part is they're great for wildlife, especially turkey, other birds, because they produce fruit that the birds love. And small mammals, you know, mice, other, other animals will eat the grapes as well. But they're really bad for trees because uh, several things. When a grapevine reaches the top of a tree, it spreads out the vines and the leaves um, of the grapevine plant itself can shade out the leaves of the tree. <clears throat> Further, the grapevine can act as kind of an anchor, so in a high wind, the tree may want to sway in one direction and the grapevine stops it and snaps the top of the tree out. And some of you have probably seen uh, the results of that. So um, we typically want to keep a few grapevines per acre in low quality trees for the, for the sake of wildlife. But in, in this particular stand of trees, there were grapevines everywhere. We, we cut thousands of them out of that area. The middle picture, uh, I believe that's a picture of a black walnut tree, if memory serves me. Um, and that's a tree that we pruned to increase the potential value um, in the future. Are the grapes good to eat? Generally, no. Um, they are edible, and you can eat them. Uh, they're often pretty bitter, um, but they are wonderful for wildlife. Um, the bottom picture shows uh, an area that was thinned out, and that stack of wood is what the, um, they, re they got for firewood. Yeah, you can keep that picture right there, the next one here. Um, the tree planting um, photo. Tree planting can be done for a wide variety of reasons. Um, for your own personal aesthetics, you might be planting trees of the kind that you want, like the uh, sugar maples or something like that for for uh, the gold color in the fall. You can plant trees for the future for timber production. You might plant them along a stream for water quality. And another quick aside is if you have a stream on your property and uh, you have enough area and there are no trees next to that stream, you have a really good chance of the government uh, stepping in and um, helping you pay or completely paying to plant trees along that stream uh, for the sake of water quality. So that's a program and things to look into. Um, trees are great for erosion control and then a wildlife benefit. You can go to the next slide. So this um, particular picture while we're changing, that's, that photo was of an old pasture area that was no longer needed in pasture and it was beginning to be taken over by undesirable plants and so the landowner wanted to put something there that was valuable for the wildlife he was trying to help out. So trail building. Um, <clears throat> Trail building is, is great for a lot of reasons. It's an opportunity for timber stand improvement. And what I'm, it's twofold what I mean by that. One is you can select where your trail goes to eliminate some trees that you don't want, um, as well as it gives you access into your property for work in the future. And trails can be anything from uh, a little hiking trail like this one is to an ATV trail on up to uh, something that would, would work with your four-wheel drive vehicle. Um, trails are good for erosion control and fire breaks. Let's go on to the next slide. And that trail that you see in the, in the photo, that one was done to replace another trail that was eroding away. Okay, wildlife habitat. I, I would say that um, the vast majority of my clients um, love wildlife, I love to see them. Many of the clients that we have are hunters and want to improve um, to encourage a particular species like deer or turkey or squirrels. And there are a lot of things that you can do for wildlife, um, including what's on that list, um, the brush piles, 
a snag is a is a dead tree, so you can purposefully kill and leave standing um, a tree which would be taken over um, in the future by something like a pileated woodpecker. Some people call them pileated. I call them pileated. Um, that would bore into that tree to, to make a nest. Uh, you can plant trees, install food plots, really popular with hunters, um, build nesting boxes, or you can release crop trees. And I sort of alluded to that earlier. If, let's say, you're trying to encourage deer or turkey, you might want to have more oak um, to produce acorns. And so you'd pick out your best oak trees and your best hickory trees and, uh, and then cut the trees from around them. What's a good food plot? Um, if you haven't tried turnips, try that. Um, that works really well for deer. Believe it or not, they actually dig the turnips up. Um, let's see. A whole there's all kinds of um, of available commercially kinds of things. Now, and then there's a type of grass that is actually escaping my my thought right now. But there's a fairly common grass that deer really like. Um, so you'd have to get back to me later on on that. But um, as you, if you have a garden in, around your house, or if you've ever tried to plant ornamentals, then yes, orchard grass, thank you. Um, you'll probably find out that deer will eat just about anything. Um, right, clover, definitely. Okay, um, that photo right there is um, a hillside. Those trees that you see there are actually very big trees in diameter. This is a photo taken after uh, the first harvest on that property. And we did the crop tree release, so that's kind of what a crop tree release looks like, although it's a little bit heavier than that uh, in this photo. So there's pretty wide spaces between the tops of the trees. And we also, uh, this area had not been, nothing had happened to it in, in a, probably 100 years. And there were a lot of uh, diseased and damaged trees. So in addition to the crop tree release, we also marked a bunch of diseased and damaged trees for removal as well. But that's what it looks like after. And that right there is probably the opposite of what would happen if you, um, if you had told a logger, even a, a logger who's really good um, in the woods with their, their ability and all that, they probably... Um, being business-minded and trying to get you the most money, they probably would have removed all of those trees that you see in that picture, and they would have probably left the less desirable ones. But we like to do it the, in reverse. We take out the junk first, clean out the trash, and leave the best ones. And the purpose of that is so that those really good trees can also provide seed um, for new seedlings that would be of the highest quality. Uh, and then you also have a second harvest waiting for you. And this one, I think it took um, about 12 years to 15 years uh, to get some trees established before we came back and removed um, most of those trees that you see. So we regenerated the forest because those trees were pushing 200 years old and they were um, actually starting to die out. Um, so that's what we did there. Next slide. And this, this one here is on the same property that you just saw, but it is um, not in that picture. It would be way off to the left of the previous picture. And it was a different stand. And so like I mentioned before, you have different stands and you do different things. And this one is in a small sugar maple stand. Um, just waiting on that next picture. There you go. And so we marked in blue ribbon, we marked the sugar maples and some other desirable trees to keep and then came in and cut everything else uh, away from those. And the, this, the trees that were cut became firewood. So next. So a different stand, different, uh, different procedure. This next picture, you're going to see a, uh, a wetland area that was created. Um, it's a, uh, an area of several ponds. And these are shallow ponds where we did um, the ponds and we planted uh, a variety of plants that were 
good to feed ducks because the person wanted to have ducks, and so obviously we have duck houses that are all ready for occupancy too. Next. And the next slide is, is a, uh, <clears throat> a picture of some of the, uh, one of the plants that we planted there for aesthetics as well as uh, for the wildlife. It's a picture of a flower, and as soon as you get to that one, you can go to the next one. Okay, we're getting we're getting ready to wrap things up here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to get back to uh, this third case study. This is one one of the many areas in this in this third study before picture, and you can go to the next slide. The uh, while we're waiting there, the before picture does have um, grapevines in it. It is a in a stand that had um, multiple sprout. Uh, coming up from each stump, and so at some time in the past that had been cut, and then the tree re-sprouted from the stump, and uh, those are mostly red maple, and so this was a big experimental area. Don't have it's a great thing to go look at someday, but don't have time for that right now. But this is what we did um, uh, after thinning it and pruning the trees back. Got a great deal of firewood. You can go to the next slide. So I wanted to get into. Uh, showing you what we actually did and, and talk about some of the costs so that, again, you get an idea for your own property, perhaps, what it might cost. So this was um, this is what we did in this in this one area. And I don't want to uh, – I think, Sherry, these are going to be available, are they, later on, the slides? Do you yes. Know? Uh, we'll, put okay, a yeah, we'll, we'll put a recording yeah. up on the YouTube channel. Right, great. So we're, we're not going to um, – belabor all the statistics there, but what you can basically see from the from the bottom, um, and basal area, the, that's a term, I'll just touch on that quickly, basal area just is a representation of how much ground the trees occupy. So if you had a, if you had a piece of paper in front of you, eight and a half by 11, that's almost 12 by 12, that's about one square foot of basal area of a sheet of paper. And so if you have, um, 100 square feet of basal area, it's like having trees that are all that size, 100 of those on an acre. And so it's one way that foresters look at things, and, and we have lots of charts and graphs and stuff to play with um, to help us know how many trees to cut and that sort of thing. So in this area, the bottom line is um, it was an overstocked area first, which means there were too many trees, they weren't growing quickly, and we took it down to what we call fully stocked, which is more of an ideal situation and removed a bunch of basal area. And we also took out the smaller trees generally, so you, your average diameter actually went up. And so it, it went from looking like a very crowded, um, uh, not a very attractive area, to something that looked a little bit better. So uh, next slide. And we'll get to the, this will be, we're, we are getting near the end. This, this gives you the cost. Um, so it took, on this particular project, it was 71 hours of labor. We cut 2,000 grapevines, thinned out that area that you saw in the photo, built five large brush piles with the trees tops that we cut, put in 10 nesting boxes for bluebirds, and the landowner received five cords of firewood from that 2.85 acres, and they did apply for cost sharing from the government, um, and the cost sharing they were paid back a portion of the nesting boxes, and they were paid for the grapevines that were cut. That program does not exist right now, which is really a shame. Uh, and they were paid for doing some of the thinning. And so their actual out-of-pocket uh, for that area was just, and I say just, I mean, it's a lot of money, but um, $561 is what they spent to get five cords of wood, ten bluebird boxes, brush piles, and to make their property look better. So, uh, next slide. Yeah, we're nearly, we're nearly done, folks. If you can hang in with it just a couple more minutes here. So the summary of the other things that we did on the, on the larger property, and you'll notice on the right, we got volunteers for a whole lot of this, but we did some firewood um, thinning. Uh, we did a timber sale that brought in some money, uh, tree planting, constructed trails, uh, and did a number of other things. So, uh, next slide. Uh, 
And the, the next slide you're going to see is a picture of an old, dead, giant tree that's hollow. And uh, this we decided to leave uh, as a something that wildlife could be used um, in addition to simply being cool because um, this property is often used by kids and they love to see this, but we always have to check to make sure there's no bear in there. So next slide is definitely big enough to have a to be a bear den. And, and by the way, you could have, you know, we could have taken that old dead tree and we could have uh, cut it up for firewood, but we decided just to leave it. So, um, another look at the forest floor on the way out. Uh, and this time you've got a baby turtle among the moss and everything else. You, and just another reminder, you have to be careful with what you're doing. Um, there's a lot of things that live in the forest that we have to be aware of. Uh, next slide. This next one, while the, while the slide is coming up, I'm going to tell you that it's a picture of a birdhouse. And the funny story um, behind this one, uh, we were putting up some birdhouses for, for a fellow. And this, uh, I believe that is a tree swallow. I'm not a bird expert. I know it's not a barn swallow, at least I don't think that this one was. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But while we were putting this house up, we weren't even finished um, with the installation of the house and this this swallow started to fly around and actually landed on the house before we were even done attaching it and so it was like the vacancy sign was up and the bird flew in and took it so next slide and I think we're I think we're done at the next one so in summary you guys that own property Think about what you want um, from your property. Um, what are your dreams? What are your goals? And then maybe consider having um, a state, a county a forester come in or a consultant forester come in and investigate uh, the property's potential based on the trees and the shrubs and the wildlife and all that that's already there. Have them help you analyze those resources and merge all that into a plan. And when you get your plan, Remember, you'll get the tax break if you're in Maryland, and, uh, and then you'll get a list of recommendations, and then you go to work um, and enjoy. So that is, that is my presentation for tonight to give folks an introduction to the kinds of things that a consultant would do um, and the kind of opportunities that are out there. And uh, if we have any questions, if anybody's still on, uh, wants to ask anything, go right ahead. Yeah, that was awesome, Jules. Thank you so much. I learned a lot and uh, you did an awesome job of presenting that information. And um, so I was just going to talk about a couple of slides here uh, at the end. And while I'm chatting, if you have questions for Jules, you can put them in the chat box and I'll give the floor back over to him to answer those questions. But we just wanted to let uh, folks know, especially those who live in Maryland, that we do have um, the, some helpful websites that are located uh, both on the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service page and also for the University of Maryland Extension. So here we see the link to the um, Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service and they just have a whole lot of great information on this page. Uh, you can find a list for licensed tree experts, licensed forest operators, master loggers, consulting foresters, um, and you, as well as being able to find information on uh, Maryland regulations and tax breaks and all that kind of good stuff. So that's a you know, really good resource for you. Ashley, could you go to the next slide, please? And then uh, we have the University of Maryland Extension webpage, which is uh, the Woodland Stewardship Education page. And there you will find information about uh, a woodland stewardship education. And they, they train a bunch of folks, uh, I guess once a year, and it has to do with how to manage their own woodlots and with the understanding that they're going to do some management on their own property or help their neighbors with it. 
and there is a uh, course, The Woods in Your Backyard, and that is going to start August 31st, so there's still time to sign up for that course. It's with Jonathan Kays, who's going to be our speaker on uh, September 1st and also on the 15th. And also we're offering a general forestry course, which you can sign up. Uh, it's not starting until September 1st. And on this page, you'll also find a link to find out more information about the Master Logger, Logger Program and how to participate in that. You could also find issues of branching out, which is the uh, our University of Maryland Extension newsletter that has to do with uh, woodland storage. Okay, I think that's about all I wanted to say. So um, if there are questions, and this is just uh, more information, a link to, uh, to sign up for the woods in your backyard. And th this uh, presentation will be mailed out to you. So um, you can take a look at uh, those links when it gets mailed out to you. And also we wanna bring your attention to our other classes that are coming up September 1st, which is Understanding Silviculture, the Art and Science of Tending a Forest, and that's with Jonathan Kays, our Forestry Extension Specialist. And then I will be speaking about invasive insects in your woodlands and how to manage your, your woodlot for that. And finally, we will have um, some folks from Extension talk about landowner liability and recreational access in Maryland. Okay, so if there are questions, Jules, you can, can you see them in the chat box? Um, hang on a second. Uh, I did see the one that says, how do you get a hold of a, of a forester in North Carolina? Well, for any state, try to, I would say, start with your state department of forestry. Um, there are, in almost all the states, they have uh, paid personnel that are there to give you essentially free advice Sometimes there will be a, a small fee associated with that. Um, but Maryland has a, a foresters in every county, and uh, so even North Carolina. Uh, I have visited there, love North Carolina, um, and but I can't swear. I'm pretty sure they have a North Carolina Division of Forestry. I know that Virginia does because I used to work for Virginia. And so start there, and uh, they will give you uh, links to other resources. And you know, today it's great with um, being online and the internet. You can Google just about anything and come up with uh, the answers to things like that. So, um, yeah. What other what other questions? I'm not Very finding true. any. I have a question for you, Jules. Yeah. Um, I was just entering what interested in, in knowing what's going on with the the timber market right now. Um, it seems like housing is booming and having a hard time finding uh, boards and blues and Home Depot to do home uh, projects. So I was just wondering, is the, the forestry in industry doing real well right now or what's going on? It's, it's always a mixed bag. And I've been in this, in this business for you know, 35 years or so, and I have yet to figure everything out every week. Um, you have a lot of things at play. Um, yes, we have a housing market, um, but we also have the COVID thing going on. And prior to that, we had um, a really bad, uh, well, the, the export business uh, wasn't really great, and the import business was harming the forest industry. A lot of imports from other countries that were cheaper than what we can produce. Uh, so you have international things to consider. You have local um, local issues to consider. The the international issue um, that there was a period of time that forced the closing of a lot of mills in our in the country, and that was fairly recent. And so we've lost a lot of our production capability. Um, and you also have each different mills in the area will will specialize in different products. And so some mills are doing very well, others are not doing so well. Um, I'm hoping that this housing boom is going to help us, uh, certainly with the hardwood production, as well as pine, um, because we need pine for two by fours and other uh, particle board, oriented strand board. Um, but I'm hoping that the hardwood market's gonna pick up 
you know, for things like flooring and molding and cabinets. And so uh, time will tell. Um, so uh, that's, that's it's not really an answer, but there are just so many factors um, that are happening all the time. So I'm going to leave it at that. What else? Okay. So thank you. Uh, there's a question that says, what's a good spacing for a trail to create a good fire break? You don't need a lot for a fire break. Um, so uh, what I recommend for people is to build a trail that two people can walk uh, side by side on because that allows you uh, obviously big enough for one person. Um, but then um, you can have a friend you can hike with. When you're talking about a fire break, uh, and I fought uh, a lot of fires in my life um, when I worked with Virginia Division of Forestry, and you do not need more than a, about a foot uh, for a fire break to get started because you're almost always going to be using a backfire. Um, and so you're, you're creating just enough uh, area that you can safely set a backfire. And so a, a, a trail that's four feet wide, more than enough for that purpose, plus um, a four foot wide trail can actually stop a lot of the, the really the common uh, low to the ground. We have a lot of ground fires in the eastern United States. And if they're not, uh, it's, if it's not a horrible fire situation, a small ground fire would hit a four foot wide trail and just burn itself out. Um, not at all the case in uh, California. Totally different animal out there. So. Oh. Uh, is there an approximate price range that private foresters charge to create a management plan? Um, the, uh, the, the one answer to that question is yes. Um, the state of Maryland, let's go with what I know in Maryland, you can get cost sharing to help pay for that. And um, the Mar state of Maryland goes by a formula uh, that takes, uh, allows $10 per acre for your property and plus $400. So if you had a a 10 acre property, that would they're allowing they're assuming you're going to spend only $500 to have that plan written. Um, speaking for myself, I can't do it for that price, uh, and so we charge uh, more than that. And then Maryland would uh, pay back 65% of that formula. So, uh, and if I did the math really quickly here. 65% of $500, you'd get back $325 if you did a 10-acre plan, and uh, my fee would be more than $500. Um, you will, you will, I, I will say that there are foresters in the region that would charge uh, $2,500 for a plan. Um, and some of them will do plans for less if they think that there is a timber sale on the horizon where they can make more money um, by doing a timber sale. Okay. And if you go with Maryland, um, the, the Maryland foresters have a set they have a set fee um, that goes according to the number of acres. So, and by the way, Maryland only does plans 10 acres and larger, which leaves the uh, the niche for me. Um, five acres to 10 acres, Maryland won't do, and so I can do. A lot of those, um, but for a 10 acre to a 25 acre plan, Maryland would charge you $200. Uh, so that would be your final final price. But they're well, in competition you. with me, so you know I don't I don't love that <laughs> aspect of it. <laughs> right. I I do have a question for you, and there's one other in the chat. But um, I was wondering, what are the most valuable timber species right now? Um, high quality white oak is doing well, um, and that's probably related not only to uh, the aspects of flooring, but because of the um, the bourbon industry. Uh, white oak is used mm. for bourbon barrels and whiskey barrels, um, and there is a huge demand for whiskey right now, which may or may not be related to COVID. Um, but it's been going on for about a year, and the projection is for the future there's going to be demand for white oak in our lifetime. And that was compounded by one of the largest manufacturers had a fire and lost all of their barrels. 
So, oh there's, so white oak is valuable. Um, uh, black walnut is always consistent. Um, it's, uh, and we, you know, we price things by the board foot, which is a, mm -hmm. a piece of lumber 12 inches by 12 inches by one inch thick, a uh, board foot. And you can always get, uh, or, I mean, historically, these are, these are generalizations, but historically always 50 cents a foot for black walnut. So that's $500 per thousand board feet. And recently it's been up more like 800 to to 1000 um, dollars And so that's a good price. Um, trees have different qualities. Um, you know, the individual tree can be of different quality. And so you're looking for a tall, straight, um, symmetrical um, tree with no branches, large diameter around it um, of a high value species like white oak or black walnut. Uh, sugar maple has always been pretty high as well. Um, and so you're looking for that. If you get the perfect tree, then it can becomes veneer, and then you'll get more dollars for veneer. And so that's also why we do the timber stand improvement kind of thing, is a lot of times we will be picking out the best trees to grow and pruning them and that kind of thing to make their value increase in the future. Very good. Thanks. Um, so there was another question about if you're making a trail, is it a bad idea to use old tires to line a trail? Huh. Um, that's going to be your personal preference. I, um, you have to decide if, if the aesthetics work for you. Uh, they, you know, tra the tires will last just about forever, and and they generally, I mean, my my understanding of that situation is that it it does not it does not result in a significant amount of pollution over time. There is some, I'm sure, um, but it doesn't really poison the ground. Um, that's what I've been told. And so it's not really harmful. It just uh, might not be as aesthetic as you want. The flip side of that is that it does last nearly forever. And so you're not having to replace uh, the side of your trail uh, that you would if you used uh, trees for a liner of some kind. But also, just while you're thinking about lining it, make sure that you've, no matter what you use, you've got places for the water to escape um, so that you're not making the water run right down the trail and erode it. Yeah. Very good. Well, um, I think I think that's all for the questions. So all right. I guess we'll we'll bring it to a close and um, I just really appreciate you coming on and sharing all your wealth of knowledge with us, Jules. And My pleasure. Yeah. everyone. Yep. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry and Ashley.